last time. Um, and we are going to close this because it's time. There's a little bit of a ushers. Birthday party, I think. Um, no, it's an ushers uh, fellowship. So all the ushers oh, okay. got together. Got some chocolate cake and cookies. And yeah. We got, we were able to get a piece of cake with the Tender Ushers for about five minutes to chase. So I have something in my teeth, just let me know. <laughs> I'm going to check mine. You want to check yours? No. Difference between females and males. They're like, we got this. We don't, we don't need to worry. Um, so we are, before we start prayer, we're reminding everybody that this book that we're reading is fantastic. It's um, When Life Hurts, Finding Hope and Healing from Pain That You Carry. And we, this is not a marriage book, um, like we normally pick a marriage book this is truly a book for everyone so we tell everybody that if you have not seen this book or read it please get it because it can help anyone from anyone from 10 years old to 100 years old we met somebody that was 100 years old it was amazing or even older yeah she was 100 years old and eight days yep. and she was still climbing stairs to her bedroom she was a spark plug. yeah and we we're like wow we just met her a couple weeks ago um do you want to pray you want me to pray go ahead Father God, we just thank you, Father, for today, Father. We thank you for every couple here, Father, whether they're planning to get married, whether they're already married, or even couples that um, there's just one of them here today, Father. We thank you, Father, that you will protect them, guide them, bless them, love them. And we thank you, Father, as we talk about this chapter that Jimmy Evans has prepared, that we will um, open up whatever it is that they need, Father, to be vulnerable and come out of the hiding like the chapter calls. And we just thank you for a great service tonight, Father. And we thank you for a great service next weekend for our guest speaker. And we thank you, Father, for um, Jeff and I's marriage, Father, that everything we speak will not be from us, but from you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 We're excited next weekend. Um, we always have an amazing speaker here, right? Because Pastor Joel's an amazing speaker. But next weekend, we have Tyler Perry. Do you guys know who Tyler Perry is? Yes. Yeah, and do you guys know who Medea is? <laughs> yeah, my son said it would be so funny if he walked in as Medea. <laughs> but um, I think we got the whole cross thing, at, you know, the cross dressing thing at church. But oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going there, but thank you. Oh, fine, <laughs> fine, fine. Um, so Jeff's trying to snatch this out of my hand, <laughs> and this is the new I'm little. So excited about it. I know we were so excited about. Oh, this. and that because I also brought it from the back. <laughs> and, um, and, um, no, <laughs> um, so we are so excited that Spark is coming, and Spark is um, our actual conference that we have for marriages. And again, whether you want to be married, whether you are married, or whether you're in a relationship, Spark can help every couple see um, the humor and, and also the rough times in marriage. So we have amazing speakers. We have Dr. Gary Chapman coming, which is the author of the Five Love Languages. We have Chris Brown coming. Um, and uh, John and um, Aventure Gray will be here. Our very own Pastor Clayton and Ashley, and Pastor Joel and Victoria, and Dr. Les and Leslie Parrott. Which we haven't had Joel and Victoria speaking together at the marriage at a, at a marriage conference. Yeah, so it's going to be exciting. Yeah, because they're, yeah, they're going to be talking intimately about their marriage. Yeah, or the struggle she has with husband. That <laughs> <Yeah>. he <laughs> smiles too much. I'll, I'll leave that up to them. <laughs> and, um, Dr. Um, Les and Leslie Parrott are um, the founders of Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. So we teach that every week at the same time we're here in a couple classrooms down. So they're, um, we're here last year, they're amazing. So We've also taught from a couple of their books as well. So our chapter, I'm gonna move this, tonight is called Coming Out of Hiding. Coming Out of Hiding, what does that mean to you guys? Just shout some stuff out. What does coming out of hiding mean? not ashamed anymore of something good or bad what else guys being open with your emotions and sharing being open with your emotions and sharing what else what about you claudia being vulnerable being vulnerable i love that what else guys <laughs> anything no right or wrong answer she's she's looking at him going say something <laughs> say something <laughs> 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 Shame or condemnation that we live in, absolutely. Anything you guys want to add to that? Anything. It could be children. You know, you see them play hide and seek, and they hide from you know their parents. Anything hiding. You know what I mean? Just the word hiding. 
Where's the first word that we hear about hiding in the Bible? Oh, Genesis. Genesis. Yes. When Adam and Eve, when we talked about that in the class before, when I when I started to read this, I thought of that because the first thing that the serpent did was made them feel ashamed of their nakedness, and they went to hide. And God said, "Who told you you were naked? And why are you hiding from me?" God knew where they were, right? I mean, just like God knows where we are. So this has been an amazing chapter, and um, I mean, this entire book. I'm just in love with this entire book. I agree. And I, mean, I don't even want it to end. This, this chapter is actually part three, um, uh, the, the Hurt Redeemer. And any time I hear anything to do with redeeming, that actually lights me up. And I really kind of, you know, kind of makes my ears perk to, to try to dig into it and see where we're going with that. So in the book, if, if you've been following along with us in each class, the book's kind of identified hurt pockets. Uh, they, they've identified where those hurt pockets originate. They give you tools to identify, as we've talked about in, in other chapters, they give you tools to identify the, let's say Michelle says, those pants look funny on you. And my immediate reaction is like, I don't care, I'm going to wear them anyway. That would be your immediate reaction. That wasn't just a, um, just a hypothetical. <laughs> well, Let's just say <laughs> that my reaction was, I don't care, I'm wearing them anyway. When we're identifying and working our way through this book, in, in my mind, if you haven't heard me talk about it, my mind is, works very in a linear fashion. I'm very kind of time sensitive. So this, this outline that I created for you today is, is very linear as well as that it works through the steps of the chapter in that, okay, we've identified what's going on. We've identified that there's an issue with our anger or whatever that reaction, whatever that hot button is, where what we've talked about in other classes is, okay, so we get into these silly arguments. They don't feel silly at the moment when you're in the middle of them. In fact, they usually hurt like heck. But when you're done with that argument, you kind of look at each other after you've kind of worked it out however you choose to work it out, and you look at each other and go, that was kind of dumb, mm -hmm. what we're arguing about. And I, I don't mean to use the word dumb in, a, in that manner, um, but when you really start digging into what this book is, has kind of led us up to at the, to this point, identifying what's the trigger, why do you have that trigger, where does it even come from? One of the questions that I love um, in, in, and I, I talked to actually my brother about this, is he started spouting all of this blah, 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 you know, victim, poor me, poor me, victim, victim, victim. And I, I asked him one simple question because of this book, and I said, where does that all come from? And it stopped him in his tracks, and he stopped talking. And he said, that's a really good question. I don't know. Hmm. And I said, well, call me back when you figure it out. And I love that. Can yeah. I, I love it. Can I jump in and say these two, um, these two um, scriptures? Yes. Um, so like Jeff said, this is a part, this is one chapter of three parts, the Hurt Redeemer. Um, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, Psalms 147, verse 3. Praise the Lord who redeems your life. From the pit and the, is that crowns? I can't see. And crowns you, yes. Yeah, crowns you with the love and compassion. Psalms 103, um, verse 2 and 4. Um, also, do you want me to read that one again? I love if it. you'd like. Yeah, I've got that one highlighted on the, uh, on the handout, where among um, uh, the many great things about admitting your weakness and vulnerability is that it's so relaxing. And I dig into this a little bit further into the handout, um, Dan Hayes, this was Dan Hayes' quote, he said, I don't have to be fake anymore. Hmm. Um, and, and that's pretty heavy. Yeah. That's, that's really heavy because if you want to talk about your second most intimate relationship, your first most intimate relationship is with God. Should be. Your, should be. Mm -hmm. your second most relationship, intimate relationship, is with your spouse. Mm -hmm. And this chapter is specific to the, the subject of you don't have to hide anymore. 
You don't have to pretend. You don't have to put on that fake face. And they, they, uh, they had a really good story in this chapter about uh, a gentleman that, that Jimmy Evans helped counsel. And we'll just call him John Smith. I would think that we all probably have a fairly good idea that we know a John Smith at some point in our life. And John Smith is the guy who looks like he's got it all. He's well polished, well spoken, he's got a great family, goes to church, gives to other people. But when one small thing happens, whether you see it on the news, God forbid, whether you end up having a frank conversation with them, or they go to counseling, and you find out that that person that looks like they have it all together is completely a mess. Mm -hmm. Just well, Jim, yeah, and I love that. Jimmy Evans said that he was a man's man. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, he knew about football. He knew about fancy cars. He had a great house. He had a great job. And everyone said, you have it all together. But where Jimmy Evans was going was that behind the closed doors, he was an alcohol, he had alcoholism that was ruining his marriage. He was abusive to his wife and children where he would think that he was just being the man of the house. Anyone else looking in would say that he was being abusive to his wife and children emotionally and mentally. And he also, when you looked at him, everyone thought that he was full of confidence when really all he was was a hurt little boy that was hurting inside that really didn't know what rage was happening inside of him. And when Jimmy talked to him and Jimmy started to counsel him and started to help him, there was a lot of things inside of him, like Jeff said, that were hidden that he never felt that he could let out or share. What was very interesting with this chapter, because I've seen this happen in my own family, is that um, the wife showed up and hid for her husband. How many times do we see mm. people in our life that we cover up their sin? because of our own shame. And I've done it, I've done it, I'm like, whoa, that was really deep, you said that about our family. And we're like, why do we have to expose it all? And the reason we say those words, why do we have to expose it all, is because the enemy wants us to keep some of that hidden. Because the minute we um, release it in, out of the darkness to the light, the healing can begin. And see, we hide stuff for friends and family and our own selves because of what you guys said, of being vulnerable, of being afraid or not wanting to communicate or our own insecurities. You know, our own insecurities that I cannot let this out. I can't talk about abuse in our family. I can't talk about that I was molested as a child. I can't talk about that my dad is a raging alcoholic or my mother cusses me out or, you know, I stepped out on our marriage. They can't talk about that. And it's interesting, they'll come and talk to us and we will do our best to guide them and love them and pray to say, hey, you have to find a way to be able to share this with the person that you're involved with or with the family member. And it's not our place to say that they, they need to go do that. We encourage them because we say that's where the enemy will lurk and hide. Yeah. He will use that against you. He will want you to hide like he wanted Adam and Eve to hide. So One of the questions that I put on here that I, I think is very, very relevant to where we are in our marriages and where we are in our walk with God is how do you show up when no one is looking? Huh. That's, I think, a really important question. And if, if we take all this knowledge that we've taken and gotten to this point with this book and we understand you know, my hurt pocket is abandonment because of my father. My hurt pocket is, is this because of that. I'm aware of that now. If we take into this into into the, into mind this question, if I'm driving down the road and I I go berserk and lose my mind, screaming obscenities at somebody because maybe they don't know where they are on the road and they're either <laughs> looking at their phone, uh, the, their map, and trying to figure out: Do I turn left here? Do I turn right here? And as we all know, these Houston roads are not easy to drive on. They are not easy to drive on. Sometimes not even with your own spouse. So, <laughs> how am I acting and showing up when nobody's watching? So if I'm losing my mind over somebody who's probably struggling to figure out where the heck they're going, 
I'm giving them the, the, the benefit of the doubt on that. Or they're just cheating driving. Whatever the case may be. Yeah. Whatever the yeah. case may be. How am I showing up when nobody's looking? Right. Right. We all know that somebody's looking, but mm -hmm. that 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 particular uh, perspective, you know, what is it? What is it that you do, and know it is not good, or right, or even worse, you know it would deeply hurt others or your spouse if they found out. Hmm. What a, what an incredible question especially for a marriage class. And we're, as we dig a little bit further into this chapter, you're gonna need, I recommend, and the book recommends, that, that you dig into that and you look at that. And it's, it's a very, very uncomfortable place. I know for myself, it's a very uncomfortable place because I have anger issues. I have, I have, um, just, you know, when when somebody says or does something that I disagree with, I have a tendency to get angry at them. And there's hurt pockets from my past that are involved in that. And she made some inner vows. Whether and it's inner vows and whether I've got thoughts going through my head or I literally say that junk out of my mouth because of my anger, what am I doing? What am I doing? I am I'm hurting actually myself, but who else knows about this? Mm. This is actually the first time I've ever told anybody. I've, I've brought it out in a class. So now I'm working the book. <laughs> I'm doing the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so are you keeping uh, your true self hidden? Uh, do you have addictions, my temper, um, the abuse? If, if you have this, in any way, shape, or form in your marriage, as we work through this, I'll, I'll emphasize, depending on the severity of it, number one, find professional help. Uh, Lakewood does have professional counseling available. Um, if you don't want to look at Lakewood's professional counseling, there's many, many resources professionally that are available out there, especially if there's physical or sexual abuse involved anywhere within the within the marriage, if there's alcoholism, if there's drug addiction within the marriage, pornography. Uh, pornography, Lakewood has groups for each and every single one of those. Lakewood Recovery is a fantastic group, some fa just really good people in there. And we have actual counselors on staff that, um, that have appointments, you know, Monday through Friday, you can call also. Um, what I want to get into also with that, I know that's a heavy topic and it's not uplifting, I can feel the energy, the shifting of that piece of it. But also what is hidden, it's bad programming. So bad programming to me is, we grew up in households of, of women, my mother as a single mom and my grandma was divorced. So we had women, a, a, you know, my mom and my grandma's our main influence. And as Hispanic families, and I use a lot of Hispanic families because with the Hispanic families I've been around, they operated the way we did. We yelled and screamed all the time. And that's the way we communicated and that's the way we talked and our volume got louder and louder. We, if someone from the outside, his family, <laughs> um, could be watching and think, think, thinks we're fighting. Well, we're not fighting yet. <laughs> we are arguing very, very vocally and we get really high our pitches. We start at five. We're not fighting until we're at 10 yeah. and we can hover around seven or eight all day long. Right. And so what I mean by that, my bad programming then when you go into a marriage and you think you can talk to your spouse like that, that his programming wasn't like that, and this is the hidden stuff, my mom would yell and scream and fight, and then a friend would come over and she'd be like, hi, <laughs> come in, look at my beautiful daughter. And we would, she was just screaming and yelling at us, and you switch like that. That's hiding. That's hiding all your dirty laundry because you're like, don't want them to see how crazy we are. Don't want them to see how I treat my children. Don't want them, you know, and I, when you, you know best friends, because you all know each other's garbage, it's the ones that you don't let in that to see that stuff that are your friends and you're like, yeah, we're not close enough for them to let me, let them know how crazy we are. So with that, it's taken it to the altar and saying, I don't want that anymore. I don't want to scream and yell. I don't want to show up that way. I don't want to come across that way. I mean, we're all good. Joyce Myers used to say that. 
that I'm fine, I'm, I'm, I have my Christian card, I'm doing well, until the minute I put my feet on the ground. Yeah. And then everything would come at me. And then she'd be like, I'm praising, I'm, I'm praising worship all day until the first kid gets home. <laughs> and um, you know, so it's just the way we show up. And it's that hidden junk that we have to take to the altar and say, hey, I know this happened and we hid this, and I'm not gonna do that to my husband and to my children, to my grandchildren. So the first place that you can go, the, the question that a lot of people have and the fear and the anxiety that they have, and, and she was talking about the, the energy in the room, the heavy conversation. How amazing would it be if, if there's an issue there that, that you're hiding, hiding from family, hiding from God, that you actually have the ability to take that weight off your shoulders and put it down and release it, be vulnerable to it. Well, that healing is found in the arms of Jesus. Hmm. And I've got that highlighted in yellow. It only begins when we find it within ourselves to take the ne necessary steps. And this is where we have to ask God for the courage to do these things. Because when we come out of the hiding and we reveal our nakedness before God, these are quotes from the book, Asking him for forgiveness, we acknowledge the gravity of our problem and the depth of our pain. And in the middle of our brokenness, we admit once and for all that we need healing. So in your, in your marriage with your spouse or in your relationships with people in the world, if you find yourself showing up less than how you would hope that you would show up, I would, I would highly, highly recommend taking some time and digging into, okay, so what is it that, that I'm really hiding? What is it that I'm really not sharing with either my spouse or sharing with an, a friend and God that I need to let go of? So that's only the beginning. Once you find that out, now comes the interesting and fun part. So we must share our fear and our pain. And for me personally, this is one of the hardest things that I could ever do, is to share my hurt and my pain. Because growing up, with all my buddies and all my friends, I played sports, I was, I, like they said in this chapter, I was a man's man and all this kind of fun stuff. And they, they said, you know, suck it up. You don't hurt, you don't cry, you don't feel you, you know, nobody can hurt you because you're a guy. Hmm. Somebody says something cruddy to your face, blow it off, no big deal. You know, if somebody says something hurtful, somebody s says something that, that, as a child, could literally, you know, destroy your self-image. And that just gets shoved down and shoved down and shoved down and shoved down. And so that becomes a pain pocket, which is what we talked about previously. So now what do we have to do? Because that pain pocket, here's where the, here's where the part of the, the real problem is, is I've got this pain pocket and she gets the brunt of it hmm. as my spouse. Or you don't share what you haven't in the past with, with healthy stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and men, you're like, okay. what? I'm um, to so out. I'm, yeah, and I'm gonna share that too because um, you most men, have been taught and programmed all their life to be strong, be tough, suck it up, like Jeff said. Like, you're good, keep going. You know, they get hurt in football, just keep going, get back out there, win. Win, win, win. Or you don't go to the doctor, I mean, it's, you know, you're fine, get over it. Jeff has been a couple times, hasn't felt well, and there was one particular time that I remember, um, are you okay with sharing this? Sure, why not? <laughs> we just and, put it all out there for everybody. <laughs> What's hilarious is he never misses work. He never misses work. And he was supposed to go on a trip with me and he, for my work, when he wasn't with us yet in the conference, and he says, yeah, I'm just not gonna go. I decided not to go and I'm like, you decided not to go, you took the time off work. Okay, I said, fine, whatever. If you don't wanna go to the event for three days, that's fine. And I called him a couple days later and I was like, what is going on? And, and he's like, oh, I took off Monday. I will pick you up from the airport. And I'm like, you took off Monday too? And you didn't go today? All this stuff's going on. All along, 
he had been starting to get tested for some situations where they thought that he could possibly have some stuff going on that could be cancerous. Never told me and picks me up and I'm like, and I know you said, no, there's never going to be any. I know. He picks me up and he's like, well, I've been going to the doctor. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, because this is that brave thing that you guys as men don't talk about. And he's like, I'm fine. You were going to go to a conference. Why did I need to tell you anything? Fast forward, I had a talk with them. I said, don't do that. Let me cover you. We're your helper. Let us cover you and let us pray for you and let us be there for you. And he's like, okay, program me, deep pockets. You know, he doesn't share, he doesn't, ha he takes care of himself. So a couple of days, uh, that was years ago. And then um, a week or two ago, we're sitting at a table with a few friends. And he's like, hey, you know, can you guys pray for me? And I'm like at the other side of the table thinking, what are we praying for you for? <laughs> And he's like, I've had some blurred vision in my left eye. And, and, and I'm like, really? How long have you had the blurred vision? He's like, oh, several days. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I tell him, you know, and I have to have grace and mercy and cover him and say, you know, and let him know I'm your helper. It's okay to let me in and tell me so I can be here for you. And it, you don't have to carry everything yourself. And this is what Jimmy Evans talks about, which leads right into it. Jimmy Evans said that he was very rude and abrupt to his wife. He he's the he was a man's man. Carried um, the financing, took care of that, took care of you know what was going to happen in their their marriage ministry. And he would not. He grew up as a man's man, where the man's word is his word. If Jeff says we are not going to dinner with with Claudia and Luis, then he'll be like, well, we're not going to go to dinner. And that's how he wanted his wife to be, submissive and quiet and listen to everything he said. He said, quite frankly, he was a jerk. And he said it had gotten so bad, the stress levels in their marriage and his personal life and his work life, that he broke out with this rash all over. And he goes to the doctor. He wants them, to, the dermatologist tells him, you know, take off your shirt. Sees all this rash all over him. And he just wants a soap or a pill to be out of there. He didn't even want to be at the doctor's. They said, hold on, let me go get the nurse. She's going to play a tape for you. And he's like, what the heck is this doctor going to play a tape for me? He comes in, the nurse, and puts the tape on, and it's all about stress. What stress does to your body, that stress, when you have stress in your life, it could cause you to have um, hyperpressure. It can to have you have irritable um, bowel syndrome. It could have you have um, weight loss and hair loss. You could break out with the rash because your body is so stressed out that you're literally making it sick. Mm -hmm. And he said he was so embarrassed when they played that tape, he felt like everybody was behind the, the door, the nurses and doctors laughing at him. Because that's the lie of the enemy, especially the men, that you don't need to tell anybody what's going on with your body or what's happening, whether it's any issue, whether it's sickness or whether it's pornography or whether it's you're, you're afraid we t they, the enemy tells us these lies so that we have to live in that darkness and that bondage and that captivity, which is not the truth. And he said when he left to the car, he cried and weeped like a baby. And he said that he felt like he was exposed and he felt relief knowing that he was going to live, but he felt so embarrassed that he has stressed out his body this much. He said people would walk by and see him crying in his car. And he said he sat there for quite a while just weeping and crying and saying, God, I cannot do this without you. Mm -hmm. That's our first step to healing, like Jeff's saying. We must take it to the altar, guys. We cannot live a life of stress. The second piece to that is we play God. I have, And that is not our role. Our role is to be a mommy. Our role is to be a daddy. Our role is to be a wife. It's to be a husband. It's not to be God. And when we do that, that's when the stress comes. And to, to kind of go back to her point about the, the, the medical stuff, <laughs> the, the medical <laughs> stuff. Um, so my hurt pocket is, is control. I don't like being controlled, and it comes, comes from my grandmother uh, who favored my brother uh, in a way that made me feel almost subhuman. She gave my brother everything and barely gave me food. Um, and she told me what I can do, what I can't do. And so my hurt pocket from there, when it comes to the medical stuff, um, it, it's been, it's been built on and built on and built on with my previous marriage. Um, 
I don't want a mom or somebody controlling me telling me how I'm going to take care of my medical stuff. Isn't so, that amazing what the enemy so tells us? So that's you? that's my hurt pocket, and Which that's where that's coming from. Which is a lie. Wow. So I, it's almost subversive. Mm -hmm. I subversively say, hey, don't worry about it. I got it taken care of. You go do your own thing. And um, I also didn't trust my spouse, didn't trust Michelle <laughs> enough. <laughs> To ask her to pray for my eye first. I waited until we were with a group of friends that I knew were really powerful prayer warriors, which my wife is also an extraordinarily powerful prayer warrior. What do you think but, that does to your spouse when you do that, when you show up like that? Yeah, your and, confidence goes. Well, it just says, well, he doesn't, does he not need me? Because that's what the enemy starts whispering in my ear. He doesn't want you to know. Why, why would he need you? He doesn't believe you're a great prayer warrior. You know, all of these doubts start coming in. And then you immediately have to rebuke them and say, there's a reason for that. It's not me. I have to have grace and mercy and say, hey, you know, that was a little hurtful. Can you tell me why you didn't share it with me? Where did what that happened? come from? And where did that come from? You know, and that's the communication piece. If you do and you bring all that, because I could keep it suppressed and say, and just be mad and show up and say, whatever, go to the doctor by yourself. I don't want to hear about it. Because that's the next thing that happens out of that. The minute you shove it down, you start acting out with the other, and they're like, what is wrong with you? That's where that fork in the road between spouses has a tendency to happen. And that's the division that the enemy wants. And women are really, I see this on a lot of me, including me, me and my friends, and a lot of other women, we start having an attitude towards our spouse. They do not read our minds, and we think they should know where we're at. And we start acting out. And we're like, nothing's wrong, whatever, take care of it, you know, whatever. And really, all we want to do is be, we want to be brought in. And that's where you stop and you say, hey, that was very um, interesting, because that's our safe word, <laughs> that it's like, you're not right and you're not wrong. It was very interesting that you shared that in front of everyone without talking to me about it, unless it happened right then. And I, you know, it's, it's like, and I, so I said, how long has this been happening? It was several days. I'm like, interesting. <laughs> Covering it with grace. And knowing that it's, I'm walking him out of his pain pocket. See, I'm put on this earth, and if you guys don't remember anything we say today, I'm put on this earth with my God, your God, his God, to heal his brokenness and his hurt pockets. I cannot heal those and come alongside him and lock arms with them and say, we got this, unless he lets me know what those hurt pockets are. He's put on this earth to heal and, and the wounds and the hurt pockets that were created in a child in me and an adult, he's to lock arms with me with him and his prayer and his God and say, hey, I understand that it was a little discomforting when you grew up and these were some fears and you thought every man was going to leave you and hurt you, but I'm here to tell you I'm going to take care of that. That's his job as a man, right? Absolutely. It's and to so to, to make a point on that, one of the things that I that really kind of hit hit me really in my heart was have you fully surrendered the wounded part of your heart because when we're hiding when we're hiding all this stuff from our spouse and, and almost you can't really hide it from God but you're hiding it I love this quote in here have you so have you given your life to Christ my answer to that is yes the other part of that question is have you given Christ your pain? That is so good. Yeah, that is so good. good. My answer to that second part of that question is no, I have not. I think I can handle it because of all the of my past and my history. So, wow, revelation. That's that's almost an epiphany right there for me. In that the this block wall that I've put up because of the past relationships that I've been through, being hurt by my father, being hurt by my mother. It's not anything really different than most human beings on this earth experience in one way or another. We all feel pain. And part of the reason behind the reason why we feel pain is that's one of the way that God helps us stretch and grow, helps us learn and adapt mm -hmm. and know how to give compassion. Because if we, if we have the ability to feel that pain or experience that pain, it gives us the grace and the compassion to say, I understand what you're feeling. Talk to me. Share with me. 
I can help you through that. And the dysfunction and the pain isn't the problem. It's what we do with the dysfunction and the pain that is the problem. See, we take it on and we hide it, we shove it, we explode in it. Uh, when instead of running to the altar and saying, I can't handle this. You know, we all have said the sinner's prayer, most likely all of us in here, but like Jeff said, have we given them our pain? Mm -hmm. I talked to someone today and I'm really close to her. She's a good friend of mine. And she said, last night, I finally surrendered and told my son, I'm okay with whatever it is you're doing. I don't like it, but I'm not going to worry about you anymore because all I can do and all I should be doing is praying. That was powerful because what she's doing is she's playing God because we want people, we can't want for people, even me, as much as I love this man and as good as he is to me, I cannot save him. I can be his wife though and I can pray for him. He has to decide when those hurt pockets and those healings, he's going to lay them at the altar. Right. And that's for him to decide. And on that same point, and without being kind of dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <We're all playing. laughs> when is going to be your turning point? I struggled with alcoholism a long time ago. Well, 15 years, over 15 years ago. And instead of dealing with where does that come from I, I didn't have the tools to deal with it at that point in time my turning point was forced on me I had an accident while drinking my life changed dramatically so the point I'm trying to make is I would say please work towards your own turning point. Ask God to partner with you in your turning point. Don't become, uh, a, I'm not going to say victim, but don't let it be a circumstantial experience. Yeah. And what does that mean? That it just happens because it happens. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell, I'll tell you the reason why. Because it's typically a heck of a lot more painful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like your analogy of the pebble. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, my experience is that God gives us uh, tons of opportunities, tons of opportunities for our turning points Always. on these really, really important subjects. And I liken it to throwing a pebble into a pond. God says, there's your chance. Here's a turning point. No? Okay, here's a little bit of a big rock. Throws it into the pond, makes bigger waves. Here's your chance for a turning point. No? Okay. Dark eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's older. Boom. Boom. Huge waves in your life. Those waves can wipe out all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I heard someone say it. Um, um, we had the opportunity um, at Adra's event, and I heard someone that was their guest speaker there say that some things that happen are really meant for us, but it happens to our children or our loved ones because of those little things that we mm. don't get it. Yeah. And and I was like, whoa, that was painful for, to hear her say that. And I didn't want to believe it, and I thought, wow, that is big, whether it's right or wrong. But what I also thought of is David in the Bible. David loved God, and God loved David. But because David didn't want to bring his crap out of the dark to the light, and David did a lot of bad things, covering another man's wife, having a child with that person, that baby dying, their, the, his, his, um, all the adultery and all the pornography and everything else, his children came in and one of his sons raped his own sister, which was his daughter. He never confronted that son. And then another son wanted to kill that brother. You guys, there was a lot of darkness. Hmm. And I think of what that lady said, and I couldn't stop thinking of the life of David, which makes me cry because he was not strong enough or wanted to hide it for whatever. And he loved the Lord. We talk about David all the time, how God, he, he found favor with the Lord. He found favor with the Lord, but God never changed some circumstances until he brought the pain and hurt to the altar. So how long will we hide and allow manifestation of darkness to live in our lives and our marriages and our families and our friends and our business until we bring it to the light. They, they were talk, they were, you know, now that you're bringing that into, you know, subject, they were talking um, on Monday, Bible study, Psalm 20, 
135 and 136 and he talks about um Egypt you know like God was talking to the Pharaoh and he kept on saying you need to do this and you need to do and so he started sending the little hints you know first was like the plague and then mm -hmm. sickness and all that stuff and he you know he it never gave up to the whole ransom came in you know so yeah, yep. it's like what you say you know you don't Attention. He'll keep on because he's right. gonna do something eventually. Exactly. So can you just in a, give us an explanation of turning point? I, I kind of so a turning point would be like Jeff's. Jeff's God may have witnessed to him, you know, someone. I don't know if you can say that. In a nutshell, my weakness and and there was a lot of hurt surrounding my alcoholism, and I literally I'd, I'd ask my friends to help me stop drinking. I tried to stop drinking on my own. I went um, to a group kind of thing, and I, the, the thing is, is I never was vulnerable. If, if you grab this handout, it really goes into description of, of how being vulnerable and laying your pain at the feet of Jesus Christ will save you. That, that should have been my turning point. Mm. If I had made the decision... My turning point would have been to, to lay that all down at the feet of God and th do what I throw my hands up and say, I'm done. I'm done trying to control this. I am not strong enough. I don't have the willpower. I am done. Whatever happens from this point forward, Lord, it is your will, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. I said that after I got out of the car and I had the accident. That was my turning point. Which I, I could have, I could have made the decision years and years and years ago to seek out help, to find godly friends, to find people that I could, I could be vulnerable with and share my pain and share all of the stuff that I had inside of me, and lay it down at the feet of, of Christ, and that alcoholism would have been taken away from. I mean, you hear Richard and Sherry's testimony, if you guys know them. I mean, him being addicted to pornography and everything else. Look where they are today. They have saved thousands of marriages. They are saving thousands of marriages. They're one of the reasons why we are teaching. Absolutely. One of the reasons. And um, they had so much good in them. They had so much work to do. They had so much blessings for the kingdom. And the Lord was keeping them trapped in where they were. And when he said he got real and told people about his addiction and got around healthy Christian men that were going to call him out on it, that's where his healing began. See, we cannot, if a husband's being abusive to, their, to his wife, and I mean abusive, where there is, there is hurt and there's abusiveness. It doesn't mean physical. It doesn't have to be hitting or punching or any of that. It could be emotional, it could be, It could be, yeah, anything that's going to destroy another human being, that is where we need to bring that to the, out of the dark. Because somebody did that to us, so we're probably doing it to someone else. And that means belittling somebody, that means hurting them, that means putting them down, that means calling them names. Because we're tearing them down from what God created us to do. God created us to lift each other up, to love one another. Because being completely honest, open, and vulnerable, it's not a trait that most people have. In fact, very, very few people do. We are not typically wired to be that way. Willingness to share with others, godly people, that God helps you, that's what God helps you develop. And the, the thing that I took away from this particular part of the chapter is it's the secret to a successful marriage. Is being vulnerable and being honest. And in most marriages, it, it's I know that just in, in, in this human world we live in, it's very difficult for most people to do that. Very difficult. Now this I want to read. I've got it highlighted in yellow. And uh, I normally don't read a lot, but if brokenness alone were enough to heal our hearts, we would all be healed since each one of us has experienced moments of despair. We've all cried out to God in the depths of our pain for restoration or forgiveness or mercy. We've all been brought to a point of desperation and hopelessness and begged for God to help. That's also a turning point. But God needs more from us than brokenness. God needs us to come out of our hiding 
God needs us to confess our sins, to share our struggles with others, to do the hard things and expose the, the, the chains that hold us hostage. God needs our uh, willingness to be vulnerable and unprotected, to take off the many masks we wear in order to hide our flaws from others. God needs us to be held accountable because accountability is a critical step in the healing process. So it goes on to, to talk a little bit further in the chapter, and I want to highlight this. If there are things that you're hiding, if there are um, things, things you're dealing with, find, and I also wanted to say this, if it's something that you're just absolutely afraid that it will devastate your marriage, find a trusted counselor. Christian counselor is what we recommend. A trusted marriage counselor, Christian marriage counselor, that you can confide in and work through those things to where you get to the point where you have the ability to confess that before your spouse. Because we will not share or confess anything unless we feel safe. That's just how we are as humans. Yep. Another thing, too, that happens is um, is our mind is so amazing. I don't know how much time we have left, but yeah, one minute. One minute. so really quick, we're not we're not designed our programming. And I talk a lot about our programming. Our programming, it doesn't tell us the minute we hesitate, our brain knows what a hesitation is. When I go to brush my teeth, I don't hesitate. I put the toothpaste on, I brush them as fast as I can. I try to brush them once a week. Sometimes I forget. Uh, and it's programming, right? So I put it on, and then I do it so fast, because I'm like, hey, did I just brush my teeth? Because we do it so quick, our brain's in autopilot. Now, if I go to tell somebody that, hey, you hurt my feelings, if I go tell Claudia, and I hesitate, and I see her, and I hesitate for just a second, my brain says, what's happening? What are we doing right here? This is not normal. This is not okay. Walk the other way. And then I walk away, and I avoid her, and I don't want to talk to her anymore. That our brain knows a hesitation. Our brain knows that this, you just hesitated. Our brain's designed to protect us. It is designed to protect us. And our brain, and this is what we do outside of marriage class, is motivational and counseling and all this other piece that we do, which we teach a class on, is your brain is so intelligent. Our brain operates 40% on autopilot. It's mm -hmm. the other 60% that we show up and do that when we do something, that doesn't feel normal, our brain will say, like, your brain does not know the difference between anger and excitement. When you're excited about something and you're jumping for joy and you just want a hundred bucks and you're screaming and yelling, the brain's like, what are we doing? How are we doing this? And if you're getting angry, it's like, oh, I feel this. Now we're going to tense up because it's just, you're using energy out of that. And so when you hesitate, it's that hesitation that will stop you. So when you're about to tell somebody something, a counselor or whatever, you're going to filter that through your brain. So we can talk about that all day long. But what it is, is God, you can always take it to one person that's never going to judge you, never going to stop loving you, never going to look at you different, and that's, that's the Lord. So when you take it to the altar in your closet, in your room, in your car, you can lay it before him and tell him, I need you to tell me who do I go share this with. You guide me to the next step. Because that is very important if you are around good good counsel. And when we say good counsel, that's good people that are for you and not against you. Because if you tell a buddy, he's going to say, yeah, she's crazy, leave her. Or if you tell a girlfriend, tells another girlfriend, yeah, he's crazy, leave him. That's not good counsel. And we say married, married people and divorced people, you'll see them grouped. If someone's getting a divorce, we're like, who are they hanging out with? They're like, oh, his best friend just got a divorce. Because we run in groups. Hmm. If you're happy, we're like, who are their friends? And they're usually happy too. We run in groups. So sorry that took a little bit longer. But what we want to tell you is this book is amazing. Yeah, um, I, I highly recommend uh, reading through the like chapter. It's like 10, 12 word. bucks or something like that. Yeah, and it's, it's really very, very interesting. And, and the stories and the descriptions that Jimmy uses, it just kind of will take my hand out and just kind of fill it in and go, oh, that really, really makes sense. And please sign up for Spark because that thing is like a three hundred dollar conference for thirty five dollars. It is life changing. You get those kind of speaker chairs. Yeah, people from around the world are coming in, spending hundreds of dollars to sleep here to be a part of that and come to that. And we're Let's having sleep at, a hotel. sleep at a hotel to come to that. <laughs> so you know what I mean? Okay, so you want to pray or me? Go ahead. 
Thank you, Father, for the words that we spoke today. We know that sometimes this is not a fun chapter, that this isn't, this is sometimes heavy, Father. We want people to leave here feeling uplifted, feeling loved, feeling blessed, and most of all, Father, feeling safe, safe that you are the redeemer and the healer, Father, that the enemy comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, and we no longer need to stay in his camp, Father, that when we bring stuff from the darkness to the light, that the healing begins. So we thank you for courage, we thank you for strength, we thank you for favor, and we thank you, Father, that each and every person here will have a safe place to fall and a safe place to speak about what their brokenness is, because through brokenness, Father, is healing. So we thank you, Father, that every marriage will prosper, every finance, Father, will be a blessing to them, Father, that debt will be canceled out, that blessings will fall upon them. The same blessings, Father, that fall upon our pastoral um, pastors here, Father, falls down on this, these bloodlines, Father. Mm. So we thank you, we honor you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.